Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 466, How Do Doctors and Patients Talk About Sexual Trauma History? BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moppin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. So at BioBalance Health, we are primarily talking to patients who are aging, who have lost hormones, and especially testosterone. And that hormone is in control of sexual response. So oftentimes, we're looking at the physiology of sex. Mm -hmm. What makes sex happen? What makes it work? What makes what dysfunctions can happen with uh, sexual activity and how do we treat them? So we're always looking at the medical side of sex, but often when I'm talking to patients, they give me a history of uh, having been abused in the past or they give me all these signs, warning signs that tell me that maybe they have a sexual abuse history that they don't even know about that is making our treatment not work fully or is not allowing them to have the full benefit of sexual activity in their lives because sex should be a good thing. It should be something that makes you feel whole. It should be something that makes you feel bound to another person and it is something that everyone needs. Therefore, we want to help the whole person. So today... Brett is going to act as our expert on counseling patients who come to us with that history or with signs of sexual trauma. How, what do we? What would a doctor or even a family member ask that person to figure out if that's the problem? What signs would they have? Well, the first thing you have to do, and I let me yeah, preface please. this a little bit. I've been a, a private practice clinician, uh, mental health clinician in Missouri for 35 years. I taught at two different universities Mm -hmm. in counselor training programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things that we taught our students is that you have to ask as part of your intake interview for any patient that you get in, do you have a sexual trauma history? Mm -hmm. You ask that not because you expect the answer to be yes. In part, you ask that to convey the message. If you do, that's something that's okay for us to talk about. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to talk about it. I'm Mm -hmm. available to talk about it. I'm not going to overreact to it if we need Mm -hmm. to talk about it. A lot of times people who have sexual trauma histories will come in and present with some other set of issues. Mm -hmm. And so as you listen to them talk about what's going on in their lives, what's causing them distress or trouble or pain, you begin to put pieces together. There are uh, diagnostic codes in our business just like there are in yours. Our, Our diagnostic manual is called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Mm-hmm. And they identify all of these accepted labels for different kinds of disorders. And they tell you, here are the symptoms that you look for. You have to have three of these and two of these and five Which of those. Which is kind of... Same thing that the... the uh, medicine does. ICD, ICD, ICD-10 uh, ICD yeah, codes. ICD. They're just numbers that insurance companies can use to, to and, fill. And that's an important thing for you to say. It, it, we have to... if, if the if the client wants insurance reimbursement, mm-hmm. we have to give them a diagnosis code that the insurance will pay for. Right. But it has to be ethically appropriate. It has to be true. Exactly. <laughs> and so what we trained our students to look for is what is the least damaging, uh, acceptable diagnostic code to give this person who's suffering from these things. But and what we, in what way do you mean least damaging? Well, for instance, if, if you came in with a, a diagnosis of suicidal depression, mm-hmm. down the road, That could cause you to not be able to get life insurance. It could cause you to not be able to get a security clearance. Mm -hmm. So is there a less significant diagnosis that is legitimate, that describes the circumstances Mm -hmm. that you start with? And you can start with a diagnosis and then change it if you get further into it. Because patients think that this is confidential and nobody knows 
that your diagnosis when you go to see a doctor. But honestly, if you want insurance coverage, you give your that insurance away. company you give the, knows the, the, the uh, confidentiality away to the insurance right. company. They they take your your confidentiality, and so right. that's something that can be found out, and that it, especially if you're looking for a, a high clearance job. Well, and we tell patients if you intend to do this, you need to know that's not a secure. So confidential part of the arrangement. I don't have any control over what they do with the information. Right. You can ask your doctor, though, not to necessarily use that as a code. Right. And so that's important for you to know that it's not out of your hands. You can say, please don't use the code that is going to impair my future um, living uh, way to make a living. So. so so people come in, and the presenting problem is not usually the underlying problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to spend some time figuring out what's really going on here. And, and part of what we do is we look for patterns. Mm -hmm. So we start to see patterns of issues that fall in clusters. And, and most of the DSM diagnostic categories fall into cluster groups. And so mm -hmm. you have a whole range of behaviors and say, look at these, and it'll be one of these five or 10 things. Mm -hmm. But all of these show up in all five or ten of these. And patterns is how everybody diagnoses everything. Okay. You look for several different s significant symptoms to make you look into a specific diagnosis, like if you had low testosterone, you right. look at different symptoms. But talking about biobalanced health and what they do, what, one of the intriguing things that I have learned in working with you is the importance of the physiology, because I was trained to deal with the psychology and the emotional disruption that occurs. And an example is someone who was anorgasmic, mm -hmm. uh, a woman who would come in and say, I'm not, a, I'm able to have sex, but I'm never able to have an orgasm. I, it never finishes for me. I, we mm -hmm. just have sex until my husband's finished. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really do anything for me, except it, hopefully it makes me feel closer to him, but mm -hmm. I can take it or leave it. It's not, mm -hmm. in, but he's distressed about my reaction and my performance, but right. I can't do anything about that. I used to automatically look at that as part of a cluster of symptoms and say, well, there may be some sexual trauma history there. Mm -hmm. You know, what is your sexual history? And she would say, well, there, there isn't any. You know, we're, we're as clean as a driven snow. Mm -hmm. My family is perfect Christians <laughs> and, and well-behaved and nobody Everybody ever drank. Yeah. <laughs> but what I've learned is it could be that she didn't have enough testosterone, mm -hmm. depending on her age and her circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I've learned now from working with you, send her to a physician who can find out if mm -hmm. that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And if it is, you can fix that. And then she can come back and say, you saved my life <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't do anything except make a proper referral. Mm -hmm. But it can work in the other direction. Yes, you yeah. can get a client that comes in mm -hmm. and says, I'm anorgasmic. Mm -hmm. And you do all the medical checks that you do and find out where their testosterone is and say, well, that shouldn't be happening. Or I replace it. And they still are anorgasmic. <laughs> and, and so then you say, must be another problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to go to therapy and explore that. And so then mm -hmm. you make an appropriate referral mm -hmm. to a clinician who practices mental health. Right. And, and one then, that specializes in sexual dysfunction because right. not every mental health professional does. No, they don't. They, they should all know what they need to know. But we were talking about that as we prepared for this. Uh, because the question we want to ask people is, how do doctors and patients get into these conversations? Mm -hmm. And what are they looking for? And how, how does the doctor need to be trained? What does the patient need to know? Mm -hmm. about the safety with the doctor to come in and say, I, mean, this, I think maybe my grandfather molested me when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And when you get people who remember that mm -hmm. or who in the process of therapy remember that, mm -hmm. they are devastated. They are betrayed. And, and there's so much damage that's done by those horrific things. But it's been done ever them. since the act that has been done it to them. It perpetuates in, in, in their it lives. It colors their life. And all their other relationships. Right. So the consistent, heavy, repetitive message that I have to give male or female patients who have these histories, it's not your fault. You That's didn't right. do it. Whatever you did as a child to survive that enabled you to survive in this environment is what you needed to do, and God bless you for it. Mm -hmm. And what we want your healthy adult you to become able to do is honor this child that submitted to sexual abuse and did these behaviors or allowed them to be done. Because it's not their fault. Because it's not their it, fault. There should you be didn't no choose guilt. it, you didn't drive it, you didn't do it, and you aren't responsible for Same it. Same as if you're just hit it by a car. It belongs to the perpetuator. <laughs> I exactly. mean, it's somebody, it's, yeah. you had something done to you. So hard for them to embrace that. 
because they have been indoctrinated aggressively and painfully. For people to get away with this, yes. they lie to children and they tell them they're going to, you said, kill their puppy or, oh, or yeah. take you away their if mother. You tell anybody that, you know, I'm the scout leader and I'm blessed the little boy. And then I tell him, if you tell anybody that this happened, first of all, they're all, because they pick vulnerable kids. Right, but they always have to, they always have to threaten them with something. Right, I'll come and kill quiet. your dog. Right. Your, your mom and dad will get run over. That Nobody will believe you. They'll send you away to an institution. But children believe that. And yeah. as a child, the child me would have believed that. Absolutely. And the child anybody would believe that and would do what that person said. So they give all their power over to that person. Especially if the, the person was in a position of responsibility and then groomed the child know. with, you know, let's Makes do fun worse. things. Let's go to the circus. Let's go to Disney World. Right. Let's go camping. And then in the midst of that, well, let's do this. Mm -hmm. And the, the kid's head spinning. He doesn't know. And a person of responsibility and mm -hmm. affection says, this is an okay thing. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. And yet they feel that it's not right. But they don't know. And so they follow the lead that they are given, and sometimes they're forced. And as adults, we, if someone approaches us with that, we go, <laughs> you know, I have boundaries. Healthy adults. I have bound healthy adults. If you say, have boundaries, I have boundaries. Exactly. Don't come within these boundaries. That's right. This is this is yes. this is me, this is you, and, and that stay dog out. That dog won't hunt. Don't right. even go there. So yeah. as an adult, I have the power to do that. Yes. If I'm well, if I'm mentally well. Right. As a child, I don't have the power, and so it is not my fault, and it is not my uh, choice. So, so like so sexual that's harassment the biggest in the workplace, hurdle. You know, that's the biggest hurdle. Yeah. How do we help people, or how do we convince them that it's okay to go talk talk to a counselor because it's not your fault. You didn't do anything. You're the person that was the victim. Yeah. And we don't want you to feel like a victim anymore. The fear. First of all, they've learned not to trust. So right. how are you going to trust? And and then there's the question of can a female victim go to a male patient uh, male or a male doctor. provider? Uh, or can mm -hmm. a male provider go to a female? Uh, saying it backwards, a, a male Got victim. It. Opposite sex. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because they've already learned not to trust people of that gender. Uh, they've developed relationships. They have a history of repetitive relationships that have not gone well sexually, mm -hmm. uh, that have not gone well at all. Many times they have overlapping or comorbid issues of, of eating disorders, uh, alcohol and drug abuse disorders. Uh, problems with the police. They, they have so histories of one secret little seed that's planted, and when they're young, yeah, is damaging throughout their lives until they get to the point where they can actually talk to a counselor about it, get it out, and then deal with everything that has come after yeah. that, and and realize that it wouldn't have come after that had they not been victimized. So when I think that that's what I'm looking at. When, when a patient mm -hmm. comes to me and starts presenting with these stories that fall into this cluster of things, and I say, you know, in my experience and in my training, many people who have similar stories to tell have sexual trauma histories. I noticed on your paperwork that you filled out when you first came that you don't have a sexual trauma. Oh, no, I don't have one. Uh, okay, well, mm -hmm. that, that's all right. Mm -hmm. uh, but we want to find an answer that works in your life. We want to find a way that you're not caught up in this eating disorder or these drinking disorders or these cycles of promiscuity or relationships that fail or what ha whatever it is mm -hmm. that brought you in here. So maybe there's something that we can learn from this pile that can apply to you, mm -hmm. even without saying it, this is exactly mm -hmm. what it is. I and mean, in, in these areas, this works. So let's spend some time because the thing that we want to communicate to you, teach you, is how to regulate your emotions, mm -hmm. how to make good, healthy decisions for what you want in your life, not to be driven by hidden agendas, hidden guilts, fear and anxiety, making depression. Rep making repetitive, making repetitive bad mistakes. decisions. Yes, to fall back in the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. Here you go again. Like in, in, uh, in the 12-step industry, mm -hmm. they talk about uh, the geographic cure. Mm -hmm. Very often people will say, I just can't stand it here anymore. Nothing is working for me here. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to move away. I'll move to California and start over. Mm -hmm. And they think if I go to California and start over, nobody will know me there. I'll have no history there. Uh, I won't have any problems or complications. It's a clean start. Get a job, get a house, start a new life. What they find out when they get out there is wherever they've gone, there they are. 
And right. They, they can't run bring, away from themselves. No, they cannot run away from themselves. So, so you talk to them about that and you say, mm -hmm. that's not going to be the solution. That might buy you three months of relief, mm -hmm. but then you'll find these things emerge again in your life and it'll start happening wherever you are. So let's talk about something that I see every day. All right. I see people come in and they have sexual anorexia. They don't yeah. want to have sex anymore okay. or they never wanted to have sex anymore. Which and, could and be one of those physiological things of lo no or low testosterone. Yes, it could be low testosterone or yeah. could it be could a sexual be problem a sexual problem. It, if they've always had a low sex drive, or it could, it could be, be a trauma history. I mean, if if you saw your grandparents killed in a car wreck, if you saw someone get violently beaten, uh, violently beaten, mm -hmm. if you have a sexual so trauma, a post traumatic history, stress any of that, kind yes, of thing. post traumatic stress stuff. So we don't know, and we don't necessarily need to know mm -hmm. the specific oh, on on Monday when you were uh, your sixth birthday. No, we don't need to know the specific. We, but what we need to know is that's creating a block, and what the block is is that you, fear, anxiety, depression, behaviors that are dysfunctional. Let's talk about how to change your life so that you don't have those. Let's do something about quieting down the fear and the anxiety. Let's mm -hmm. give you some strength and some confidence mm -hmm. that you can take care of yourself. That, that you the, can trust somebody yeah. because the, the biggest thing I see is that patients can't trust their partner and, and so they can't have an orgasm because they can't relax enough relax enough yeah. with that person or with any person right. because that trust was broken decades ago and they just can't trust anyone. So they've never been able to have an orgasm or never been able to experience a, a good orgasm right. and they feel like they've been left out. And their relationships aren't necessarily full. They're mm -hmm. they're partial. So they don't satisfy all their needs. They satisfy the need of the victim script. And mm -hmm. that's that's the, the thing is I, I want people not to be victims. I want mm -hmm. you to not live a victim script. So the person you have to learn to trust is you. You mm -hmm. have to be strong enough to take care of yourself. And as mm -hmm. a child, with limited resources, you were not able to do anything but survive, which is all that you needed mm -hmm. to do because now you're here today. And, and now you, you know things and have choices and opportunities that that child didn't have. Mm -hmm. And you can protect yourself from ever being violated like that again. Mm -hmm. If you learn to have healthy boundaries, if you learn to control your emotional fluctuations mm -hmm. and swings, your impulsivity, your bad decision making. Let's work on those. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time talking about when you were six or when you were seven, what happened. Right. I mean, it isn't in the details. It's in what happened and what happened to you and what, how it changed How you get stronger, life. how you get healthier. You start with learning to trust yourself, to learn how to have good boundaries, how to, how to say to somebody, wait a minute, I don't like that. Don't do that. So uh, sometimes I, I say, I, I get a feeling that there's really, just by talking to somebody, that there's really no trauma history. And I ask them and they say no, but the, the, the trauma is not the seed that started all of this, that it may have just been low testosterone their whole lives because yeah. some people have that. And then I say, you know, my answer to that is, well, let's try to replace your testosterone to a normal level and your other hormones that are missing. And then if you're anorgasmic still, then we're going to think about counseling because there must be something that I am not an expert in, that you are an expert in, that you can figure out and help my patient. And there's some literature. Get, there's a book that I would recommend. If, if, get self-confidence. If, if people know that they have a sexual trauma history, mm -hmm. uh, there's a book called uh, Ghost in the Bedroom by Ken Graber. Mm -hmm. And um, it says if you're in a history with a partner who has a sexual, if you're in a relationship mm -hmm. with a partner who has a sexual trauma history, these are the things that are going to create problems in your relationship. These are the conversations mm -hmm. that you need to have. These are the things. And that's very hard to tell somebody to have those conversations with a person who's been victimized. Well, but that's what you have to explore. When they're, when and, they're and a child. So in therapy, coming to therapy mm -hmm. with a therapist that you trust who doesn't violate mm -hmm. you, you learn that experience, which you haven't had. Mm -hmm. and then, like all therapy, you know, you come to see me, eventually you have to take the show on the road. Eventually you have to leave <laughs> me behind and, and go and live your and life live and not have life. those problems. Mm -hmm. And so you learn to trust me mm -hmm. and you're not violated and you have boundaries and you learn to say, well, I don't like that when you say that to me. And I mm -hmm. say, okay, so now what happens? <laughs> and, and then you can go home. And, and you always start it when you start to get stronger. You start on the periphery of your life. And you learn to tell somebody in the grocery store, excuse me, I was in line first. 
Yeah, you and just you assert the line. yourself in an appropriate mm-hmm. way with a boundary mm-hmm. before you go to the central casting figure mm-hmm. in your life and confront them. Just but trial you and error. Those, you <laughs> knock those dominoes over and you develop expertise. Mm-hmm. And then you get to the place where you can say, Mom, we have to have a talk. I'm not coming to the family reunion this year because when I was young, Uncle Joe. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and you get to where, and, and Mom has hysteria and says, Oh my God, you're terrible. You're just. Join yeah, family, and blah, it's blah, blah. oftentimes the family members aren't oh, going to yeah. be on your side because they don't want to hear that just because they don't want to think that to that's in the family. Uh, and they may all know already. They all unconsciously, subconsciously, or literally know. Mm-hmm. And they say, well, but it wasn't so bad. It was only uh, that's sex. That's ridiculous. That's what they say. I'm telling you. I understand you. that's what they say, but I just so can't. Often. See, that's why I couldn't be a counselor. I'd be going, that's ridiculous. Yeah. You'd be getting a hammer. So <laughs> I mean, let's go get that. Yeah, no, I would not. Yeah. But I would be, I, I would just not be able to contain myself when I hear that that side of it and how you can you can almost see in in someone who's been abused or to, or in many ways sexually physically uh, emotionally yeah. you can see them shrink back to their little child oh my gosh, right in front of you and you can see how how hurt they were. Well, and they learn to dissociate in order to survive. Mm-hmm. Dissociation is a defense mechanism where you disconnect from the moment, from the reality, from yourself. Uh, if you've been physically abused, you learn to dissociate around pain symptoms. And so you don't mm-hmm. feel much pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a very high pain tolerance. Mm-hmm. As you get healthier, mm-hmm. that'll change. And you'll start to feel things that you weren't able to feel before. Yeah. And things will hurt that never hurt before. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I have to warn people, part of being better is you'll have some of these things you haven't ever had before. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dissociation isn't all what you don't have to give up dissociation totally to give up the d- dissociation that's damaging. You, I mean, right. everybody you don't dissoci- give up the, the dissociates. whole global dissociative process right. to give up the one. Everybody that's dissociates when you something terrible, like we were talking about when we were preparing this. When I first made my very first incision on my very first patient, I had to dissociate myself from I'm a human and I'm making an incision in another human. Yeah. You know, I had to step back. We doctors use draping so you don't look at somebody's face while you're operating on their belly. You know, we do all kinds of things. And then we, if if there was an earthquake during an operation, I wouldn't have known it. Yeah, I wouldn't have felt it. I would right. have, was so hyper focused, and that's the way doctors combat have to be. Do that all the time. So, and people who have been in combat dissociate. Right. That's a survival mechanism for specific. Right times in your life and you have to use that but it's when you use it yeah, and how want, you use it we don't it. want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. right we want you to still be able to dissociate but in an appropriate context for an appropriate reason and not to re-experience your trauma it should make you happier if if you can get rid of your anger get rid of get rid of the old ghosts get rid of worrying about that person that made you distrust other people and being able to trust people that you love again so, That's a huge jump. So, so the takeaway message is if you're going to see a physician or a counselor and you have repetitive patterns, repetitive cycles of symptoms in your life that suggest sexual trauma history, whether you remember it or not, please be prepared to discuss with specificity those things. You've got to take the step to uncover that if it's there. Uh, it may not be there, which is fine. But... If it's not there, those symptoms are still causing contamination in your life, and they need to be resolved. And so if you go to a physician and they ask you that question, don't be offended, don't be defensive, don't reflexively say no. Give some thought to that and say, well, you know, I don't know for sure. That's a good answer. I don't Mm -hmm. know. Could be. If there are physiological issues, the physician should help you find and resolve them. If there are psychological issues, hopefully the physician will make an appropriate referral mm-hmm. and encourage you, go and have this side of your life looked at to try to get you to a point of balance where you're in charge and you're living your life and you're not a victim of anything. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. 
find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.